high. Quite often in product design, product manufacture, production, repair, you might have to upgrade things in the field, you might find a fault in your product after you released it, or you might uh, want to upgrade its performance, you want to make some changes, things like that. There's plenty of reasons why you might actually want to modify an existing populated PCB. Not always can you just uh, re-spin the board, as it's called, relay it out to add a new component, add a different component, something like that. This is actually very common in the industry, and I've actually worked in large companies, uh, defense companies in particular, where they'll actually have specific component obsolescence engineers where you have to maintain this uh, military equipment, very expensive equipment, existing boards out there that have already been manufactured. You want to do upgrades to them or a component becomes obsolete, for example, and you have to replace it, but you can't just respin the board and remanufacture these things. The boards cost can cost you know tens of thousands of dollars in many cases, and you just don't want to respin those. Or they're fitted to existing equipment; they've already been qualified and stuff like that. You just want to make a small little change or upgrade or replace a component to a different package, for example. Very common that components in certain packages go obsolete over years, or they might discontinue some sort of a programmable part. You have to replace it with another the programmable part, it only comes in a different footprint and things like that. So you want to actually upgrade these boards. How do you do it? So I thought we'd take a look at it. Because let's take this board as an example. It's a ridiculously complicated board and would be seriously expensive to actually um, not only you know manufacture the board from scratch, but if, if you've got a big stock of these blank PCBs, for example, just the blank PCB can be seriously expensive. So often it makes economic sense to do what's called a, a mod board, a daughter board. It might be many other different uh, names for it. Let us know in the comments uh, if you uh, worked at companies that call it different things, but we'll just call it a mod board. So it makes sense just to uh, modify these boards with a little mod board. And of course, you might have to uh, modify boards um, of any uh, complexity uh, just to attest that your new modification works. So typically, you'll, you know, you'll hand solder that, there'll be little mod wires going everywhere. It'll be really ugly, but you don't necessarily want to do that in a production environment. Or, you know, if you've got a thousand boards, you're manufacturing a new production, 10,000, 100,000, or if you've got boards out in the field, you don't want to, the repair to go out there and have to put in mod wires, cut and strip wires and individual parts and bend them over and put electrical tape in there and just all sorts of dodgy stuff like that. So you want to do a nice simple mod board like a professional solution for modifying a, it doesn't have to be this complex, um, even uh, relatively cheap and simple boards, there can be lots of economical or other sort of uh, logistical issues why it's better to actually do a mod board. So I think it's an important skill to have, not only know that mod boards like this, and, and this is a very simple example, but even more complicated ones, like you might be familiar, for example, if you're into like gaming consoles, a lot of those illegal uh, mod boards and things like that. You can buy, a lot of people fitted them themselves too. You buy them as a kit. They might come on a little board that's sort of, you know, a weird looking board that's convoluted shape or whatever to fit around existing components. That's a classic example of a mod board to an existing product that really there was no other choice to do it. And you want a professional solution that's easy to use so that people can install it. They don't want to have to run wires and strip wires everywhere. It's better if it's a professional solution on a board, something like this. So it's really important to know that A, you can do this sort of thing and that this is a professional solution. So a really important topic. I've actually got a mod board here which we'll take a look at. And this is for the uh, 121GW multimeter. We upgrade one of the uh, parts in it. So I thought, yeah, this is a good excuse to do a video on this. So we'll take a quick look at this and maybe another example of a production mod to a real expensive bit of gear. Let's go. Now here's an example of a mod board on a real expensive uh, board. This is from uh, one of the LaCroix oscilloscopes. You remember I did a couple of videos uh, trying to repair this thing, but it was unfortunately BER, Beyond Economical uh, Repair. And can you spot, spot the mod board? Where's Wally? It's there somewhere. If you're watching in 4K, I'm sure you can spot it. Yep, there it is, down there, right on the front end, like that. You can see 
they've got this board with a whole bunch of components and <laughs> they've even like double stacked the Melf. You know I'm a Melf fanboy, so I'm really excited about the <laughs> Melf double stack in there. But a little mod board that they've obviously put on this board. Now, whether or not this was done at the production stage or whether or not it was like an upgrade or, you know, something like that, or they um, released it and they found an issue out there and they wanted to, uh, you know, fix it or whatever. If you do know the details of this particular mod, then uh, please leave it down below. But anyway, the fact is that they have actually modded that front end. You can see that they've got a little board here, obviously snapped off from a panel, which we'll go into detail in a minute, and also we'll go into detail of these little uh, castellations on the side here of the board, where they've actually soldered it down to uh, like existing components. You see, they've already got an existing component there, they've just soldered that over. And here's the blank space where it actually uh, went. And this wouldn't have been uh, designed at the production stage because if they were laying out this board and, and clearing that space in there, um, they would have just put the parts in there. So obviously post-production kind of thing or some sort of upgrade or something like that because this is a real huge expensive board. And as I said, even if you've got the blank board stock, it can be very expensive, but let alone a populator board. You don't want to scrap a populator board. Uh, yeah, it can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Or even, as I said, some of the stuff I've worked on, many tens of thousands of dollars, um, even into the six-digit category for a board is not unheard of. So they obviously like got a little bit lucky because if there was some space available, but you can always put it on top of the components really. And the fact that it was a square board, um, <laughs> that fitted in there quite nicely. So yeah, um, sometimes you get lucky. Other times, as I said, you know, if you need to connect, say, you know, this spot here over to like over to here, you might need some convoluted board that sort of runs around this chip here because it's got this uh, tie down uh, point here. So you might need, you know, and you don't want to, um, you want access to the pot. So you might have to do some weird thing. You might even have to do some flex uh, solution or something like that. But yeah, you can see how you just tie a mod board into existing components like that. It's nice and simple, professional, and it allows uh, repair techs in the field to actually upgrade these things, which is important, or just easily solder them down in production, or, or as we'll see in the minute, actually uh, treating them as a pick and place component and reflow soldering them. So here's an example of a mod board uh, panel. In this case, it's for the 121GW multimeter where we wanted to upgrade an existing uh, part on uh, some already populated boards. So it, it was an SMB part that we upgraded to two uh, SOT23 parts like this. So how do you do it? Well, let's take a look at the details because um, this is just one example. There's many ways to do it, but there's you know, lots of um, issues which go into making a board like this. Unfortunately, this is not the full panel. As you can see, it's been broken off here. And as you can tell by the uh, fiducial uh, marks up here and the rounded and the tooling holes here, uh, the panel is actually this width here. It's not hugely big, but it obviously uh, extended down here like this. And this is how you want to do it. You want to manufacture these in panels like this with either break-off tabs or uh, V-scoring or something like that so you can easily cut them out at a later stage. Because the last thing you want to do is get a tiny little board like that and <laughs> give that to your uh, pick and place uh, assembler and go assemble that board please. They'll just roll their eyes and charge you a fortune and probably just end up hand soldering it anyway. So how do you make a nice panel like this one? Well, I've done a whole panelization video, which is very popular. I'll link that in at the end and down below if you haven't uh, seen that. Highly recommended. Lots of detail on how to do uh, routing and v-scoring. And that's what we've got here. We've got a combination of routing and v-scoring. So let's have a look. You can see that obviously they've got, they've routed out this board. Like you didn't have to add this little like chamfer in here like this. It's not necessarily uh, important to do that. Uh, they've just decided to do that. No problems whatsoever. But anyway, you just route like that, like a 2.4 millimeter routing tool might be like a standard uh, diameter. As I said, look at that uh, panelization video I've done. And we've got a combination of V-scoring like that. And I'll show you up close, but as per regular panels, of course, you want your fiducial uh, alignment marks, you want your tooling holes on your outer strip like this so that it can 
can go through the uh, conveyor machine in the pick and place. So they'll have a rail up here and another rail down here and your board passes through the uh, it passes into the pick and place machine, gets picked and placed, and then it goes out on those uh, rails out in, uh, via these uh, tooling holes which move it along and it goes out to the uh, reflow oven. So you want to automate that sort of process. Now you can see that all the copper fill has been left on here. It's not on the bottom of the board because we don't actually want copper underneath here. There's just no reason to have it. But like there's been copper infill like this, just floating copper like that. And the reason to do that is just so it's nice for the PCB uh, manufacturer so that they don't have to etch away all the copper. So you might as well just leave the, uh, you know, leave the copper on there to make the etching uh, nice and easy. We've got a combination of routing slots, V-grooving, top and bottom, or V-scoring as it's called, going across the panel here. You might be able to see the detail in there. I'll show you in a sec. And also we've actually got what's what are called uh, castellations or half moon pads going right across the scoring here. That not only allows for the boards to be individually snapped and cut out of the panel easily, but then it allows you to actually solder these down as a surface mount component. Because as I said, in this case, uh, this little mod board here is actually uh, replacing an SMB uh, footprint part with uh, two, in this case, two SOT23 transistors. Now you can make this panel as large as you want, of course, uh, subject to your assembler and how it fits in their machine and whatnot. Now this is a uh, 0.8 millimeter PCB, so it's pretty thin. There's no real need to have it uh, 0.8 millimeters in this particular case, but you can see that it's actually going to be quite flexible like that in both directions. You don't want to do it too far in that direction because you're going to snap off the uh, V scoring uh, along those boards. But uh, the problem is, is that if you have one big panel like this and you stick it in your pick and place machine and it's only held with the rails at the top and bottom, when you put it in like this and the pick and place head comes down to place parts, whoops, it's going to it's going to warp in the middle like that. So uh, boards like this, um, it's quite common for your assembler to actually uh, manufacture a custom uh, tray that actually this board just sits snugly inside the tray and it's fully supported over the entire area like that. So yeah, but, but your manufacturer will um, advise on that sort of stuff and um, often just handle that for you. They might do that without even telling you. You just say, assemble my panel please and they'll go, okay. And they'll have, like, as part of the tooling charge, we'll be manufacturing a uh, holder for this particular board. Now you can see the V-groove in across there. This isn't a particularly deep V-groove. If you have a look down there, it's, uh, in fact, bottom seems to have a different depth. I wonder if that's actually uh, consistent across the board. Yeah, it seems to be. I think they've got possibly a uh, sharper... V groove on the bottom. Did I'm not sure if that's on purpose or whether or not that's just the way that the you know tolerance in how the me uh, the machine the uh, V groove wheel was actually uh, set on the thing. And there's the bottom of the board, and this V-grooving needs to be controlled, you know, fairly accurately at the factory, especially for a like a 0.8 millimeter uh, PCB like this one. The thinner your PCB gets, the uh, you know the more critical your tolerance gets on that uh, V-groove cutting wheel. But in either case, there's more than enough uh, fiberglass left in there to hold this uh, board together during uh, handling and whatnot. But it allows easy snap off. So as you can see, when you snap it off, you might be left with a few dags and things like that in there, but uh, this is fairly common. It's not generally going to be an issue. So you're left with the half moon castellation like that, and which allows you to just easily solder that onto uh, like existing pads onto the board. And then when you snap it off, you're left with a tiny little uh, board like that, and you can see that how that is basically becomes a little uh, surface mount component. There's other ways you can do the uh, castellations and uh, you know stuff like that if you really want to get all fancy-pantsy about it, but you know, those half-moon castellations work well. 
then you simply solder that as a component. In this case, you would hand solder it, but you could actually reflow it. But because this is a retrofit, generally a retrofit to an existing uh, board, although it doesn't have to be, if it's a like an obsolescence uh, component replacement or something like that, you can actually get this actually placed by the pick and place machine and reflow it. But of course, like you wouldn't have it on any um, production reel or production tape or anything like that. So you might put it, may, maybe you might do it if you're like really keen, you might do a, a specialized uh, production tray for it or something like that that held it uh, as a tray base component in the pick and place machine, which could then uh, pick it up just, you know, using your existing nozzles onto the existing uh, component and then lift it onto the board and actually place it and have it reflowed. And of course, this is a real simple example. There's only uh, two transistors in there replacing a single uh, surface mount part. But like you can make these as weird and wonderful and convoluted as you like that could like spread out over your entire board. You can even do this as a uh, flex circuit as well. But the problem with a flex board is that you don't get the same kind of uh, uh, castellation hole on the end. Uh, that you would on a, um, a fiberglass PCB like this, but you know you can have uh, pads uh, either on the top or bottom or whatnot, and then just start uh, solder bridge those on, no problems whatsoever. Both are uh, valid techniques. So in this particular case, we wanted to replace an SMB component with two SOT23 parts. And as you can see, it doesn't quite fit on there. You could sort of like stagger them a little bit. So like this one went behind there if you had the width. Uh, like this, which we didn't really have, but because we actually had two of them there and had an adjacent pad, sorry you can't see under there, but normally there's a pad there and a pad there, then uh, we can just have it going from that pad to that pad, no problems whatsoever. And this is just a real simple example, but it gets the point across. So it's just real neat and tidy, and it simply becomes just, it looks like yet another part. In fact, you know, if you zoom out of this, like you're, you're really like hard pressed to tell that you know, that's actually a mod board in there, really. So I hope you found that video useful. And if you did, please give it a big thumb up. And as always, you can discuss down below or over in the EV blog forum. And if you like my content, you can always uh, support me on Patreon. Links down below. And I accept cryptocurrency donation. All that sort of jazz. And there's merch on my store. You know the deal. Catch you next time. Hello.